Now, I would like to introduce Air Marshal Greg Bagwell, who is the president of the Air and Space Power Association. Greg is a combat pilot with 36 years service in the Royal Air Force, and he is one of our most experienced operational commanders, including combat operations in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, and Syria. So please give a warm welcome to Air Marshal Greg Bagwell. Thanks, Susanna. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, was a combat pilot. Okay. But of course, as we all know, no, no combat pilot retires, really. Um, a really, really warm welcome to all of you to this conference. I know I've already said that to quite a few of you in the room, but we've had some joiners over lunch. So particularly warm welcome to those who've just joined us uh, at lunch and coming into this session. Uh, as I said this morning, it's particularly great to see such a good crowd here after two years of the pandemic, where obviously we had to operate differently. But it's also fantastic to see so many here from overseas who have managed to get through the Heathrow bagging area. So well done for that. Uh, it just goes to show air pass sometimes does have to go down to its lowest denominator. Um, we've run these conferences now for many years in concert with the Air Force, who are the ones that really bring all the content to it. But our job is to just facilitate and give you a great experience. Uh, I apologize, we didn't have quite as much uh, uh, liquid as we should have done at lunchtime, but we'll rectify that uh, this evening. I can assure you of that. Um, so save yourself up for that. Um, we've got some great speakers, some great themes to run through. I think we all are very aware of the context we operate in. We know that as aviators and particularly military aviators because of what is going on in the world. But with this current situation in Ukraine and our thoughts obviously with them, um, then we are facing a fairly grave time. Um, I was a Cold War warrior and I'm wondering whether we're heading back that way. Some would call me a dinosaur, but sometimes when your enemy turns up as a dinosaur, you might have to think like one. But there you go. We'll, I'm sure, explore that as we, uh, as we talk through the next uh, 24 hours. If there's anything you need, either come and see me, Clive, or the team at registration, and we will sort you out. We would love to see you this evening um, when we go upstairs, um, but please enjoy the conference. Um, this is the opportunity. The Air Power Association was formed at the end of the Second World War by the Royal Air Force in order to promote air power. It recognised that the public didn't understand air power. It had its own views. Obviously, the war um, gave them a whole perspective, but they hadn't really got to understand it. And ever since then, the association has existed in order to promote air power, to get people to understand it, but more importantly, for us to think about how it evolves and how it moves forward. And that is very much what this conference is about. I apologise for the heat. For some of you, it would be like being back at home. This is alien territory for us Brits. There'll be roads melting out there and all sorts of carnage. But in this little oasis here, we will ensure that you are looked after. And uh, I'm sure that the rear air conditioning is being serviced as we speak. Um, so without further ado, after welcoming you, and I'll speak to all of you, I hope, as we go around over the next 24 hours, we're now going to have Sir Mike uh, open the conference uh, from his perspective as the Chief of the Air Force. So without further ado, Air Chief Marshal Sir Mike Wigston. Thank you, Greg. Good afternoon, everybody, and fellow Air and Space Chiefs especially. 67 Air and Space Chiefs, to be uh, precise, which I think is a record for this event, uh, for, uh, and it is fabulous to see so many of you here. I am delighted to welcome you to this Global Air and Space Chiefs Conference to, and to be back here in person at the Institution of Engineering and Technology after a three-year gap since our last full conference in July 2019. Across all our strategic landscapes, so much has changed in such a relatively short time. Space is now recognized widely as an operational domain, driven by the questionable ambition and behavior of countries like Russia and China. Our nations are rising to this new challenge with the formation of bespoke military organizations to develop our space power in lockstep with our air power. The US Space Force has formed, and many countries have established space commands or, or divisions, including the UK, Germany, Canada, Japan, or Australia. And that's in the last 18 months alone. And some air forces have even renamed themselves as air and space forces, first France, and then, uh, just last month, Spain. We've really missed the opportunity to celebrate some notable milestones together. 
including the Australian Air Force's centenary last year. And we've been reminded again and again of the strategic advantage and effect of air power. Last August, 38 allies came together for the evacuation from Kabul, airlifting over 120,000 people in the most difficult circumstances. We've worked closely together as air and space forces, supporting our national and international efforts to combat the global coronavirus pandemic. Time and time again, it was military airlift, military logisticians and military medics who stepped up, coordinating with allies, sharing ideas and equipment, working to, together to face the gravest of threats to our populations. And that same level of cooperation between us will be especially important as we turn to face the transnational threat of climate change. The last three years have seen accelerating leaps in technology, opportunity and threats. Small UASs and drones becoming ever more ubiquitous, the new reality of hypersonic missiles, or one commercial company alone launching more than 2,500 satellites in that time. In the UK, we've had a strategic review which established a vision of global Britain, our armed forces playing a key part in that with a specific focus upon deepening our relationships with allies and partners around the world. The review articulated the importance of the Indo-Pacific to global security and our collective prosperity, and, and it signaled our strategic tilt to the region. However, the review also identified Russia as the gravest near-term threat to our collective security. And three years ago, I suspect only a handful of us would have thought that in 2022, we would be meeting under the shadow of war on European soil with Russia's brutal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. This clear and present threat to our democratic integrity has made NATO even stronger. And we look forward to welcoming our newest alliance members, Finland and Sweden. Something again, I don't think many expected to hear in 2019. Across Europe, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has prompted discussion and significant announcements on spending. So NATO will be ready for whatever might come. The strongest alliance in history standing up for our core values and of collective defense, stability and prosperity. So a lot has happened since our last conference. And that's a salutary lesson to all of us as we think through as leaders what the next three 10 or 30 years will bring. The speed of change and the proximate threats we now face is why that fake focus on maintaining our leading edge matters to all our air and space forces to fight and to win. So please enjoy the sessions which follow and above all, enjoy your time in each other's company, building those precious personal relationships for our greatest strength is in what we can achieve together. I'll hand back control to Susanna, who will now introduce our first session on operational integ integration. So thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much. much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mike, thank you. Thank you.